Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. everybody? You survived the, the flash flood. Anybody get woken up by the gang, gang, gang? Hey, it was wonderful. I always love that. Uh, hey, we, we, uh, I'm Joel. Welcome to Crossroads. I'm the teaching guy around here. We're going fin- to uh, com- continue with our series today called Mas Christ, which I love that title. Um, it's, you know, Christmas, but we took the Mas and put it in front, and Mas means more. So, yeah. Just want to make sure every- everybody's clear with what's going on here. Well, let me ask you this question. If you had unlimited When I was 16, I lived in Guatemala, in Central America. That's actually where I learned to drive, which explains a lot. But uh, one of the things that used to drive me crazy in Guatemala is that the, the police down there were very corrupt. In fact, when the government decided they had to root out the corruption in the police, they decided that the best way to do it was to start a new police force. So they started a separate police force, and to get into this police force, you'd get paid more money, but you had to go through all these ethics courses. You had to give, like, all these classes on integrity and ethics, and they basically just made these the cool cops and these the not cool cops. So they they made it, like, pitted them against each other, and so all the not cool cops were, well, I want to be a cool cop, you know? So they, like, became a cool cop, and that's where supposedly they rooted out corruption. Uh, But I I would always get pulled over by cops down there, and if you've ever heard stories from me, I cannot stand corrupt Latin American cops. Um, You've heard my stories about this before. But uh, uh, this one instance, I was 16, and I got pulled over. And I'll never forget this. I was was on the side of the road in this little town we lived in, just outside of Guatemala City. And um, I I stopped, and a cop started harassing me. He was wanting a bribe. I could tell he wanted a bribe. And I was like, I'm not going to pay a bribe. I've never paid a bribe in my life. Um, And about that time, a black truck went by, and it pulled over and pulled up in front of my car. And, and my friend popped out, and he poked his head out, and then his dad got out of the car. And his dad walked over calmly, grabbed the cop, pulled him aside, said something in his ear, pointed to his car, and the cop went, went to his car, drove off. And my friend's dad was like, hey, man, he won't bother you again. I was like, whoa, that's awesome. Like, I want that kind of power. Like, that's real power. Like, how did he do that? Now, I came to find out later, that dude's dad was involved in some very bad stuff. (laughs) He was assassinated a few years later in this mysterious accidental death. He was assassinated. But I thought, man, that guy had some serious power to just be able to walk over to that policeman. The policeman duck his head and go back to the car. And I thought, man, power is an interesting thing. When you've got power, you can get, you know, I say, if you could ask for anything in the world, what would you ask for? And I've, I've learned the best thing you could ask for is power because if you get power, you can get, also get money. You can get influence. Power is crazy. So my question this morning is, what if you had unlimited power, like just unlimited power, anything you wanted is yours, what, w- what would you do with it? Some of you, you'd be like, oh, ah, man, my son, he wouldn't be out doing that crazy stuff anymore, like that. Some of you would be like, man, my financial situation, that would be done. Some of you say, I would never work again if I had unlimited power. <laughs> right? Isn't that a lot of you? You have servants, people serving you. Here's a question. Who would you take out if you had unlimited power? You know you've thought about it. Be like, oh man, that boy my daughter is dating. (laughs) Poof. I don't want it to be bloody, Lord. I just poof. (laughs) What would you do if you had 
unlimited power. Think about that there for a second. Because this morning, we're going back to this verse that we're going to be looking at the whole, the whole month. It's Isaiah 9, 6. This is the prophecy about what Jesus would mean when he came to earth. And he says this, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. We talked last week about the fact that some of you, this would really make your life a lot easier if you just recognize the government is on Jesus' shoulders. You don't have to worry about it being on your shoulders. God is in ultimate control of what's going on, and we, we vote, and, but he's, man, he's pulling the strings in the long run. And in his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. We talked about that last week. In, in Hebrew, there's no punctuation like ours. This could just be wonderful. His name is wonderful. But in this version, it says he's Wonderful Counselor. We talked about how a counselor helps point the way for us, gives us direction and guidance. And this week, I want to talk about the fact that Jesus came down as Mighty God. And this, this, this word mighty, it has a lot of meanings, right? It's gibor. It's the Hebrew what that is. You read it backwards. Did you know he, you read Hebrew right to left? No. Anyways. Strong, powerful, heroic, brave. God, Jesus came down. This is the fascinating thing about Jesus. We believe he was God in the flesh. But he, in that strength that he had, he submitted himself to being born and, and, and facing the very same things we face. So he actually partially gave up that strength, put on a human body, but yet in the middle of that, he still had perfect connection with the Father. So he had access to all power. I mean, you've probably heard it said, you know, at any point, Jesus could have called angels down and swept him up. He didn't have to die, for, die on the cross. He could have in many moments said, come down and take me off this cross. But he, he submitted himself. He willingly submitted himself and his strength to our human bodies, and then we see, we're going to look at a verse in a second and see what happened on the other side of it, because I believe that's an example for us. Because when it comes to power, power is a tricky thing. I think a lot of us think if we had power, we would use it for good, right? The challenge is, if you've noticed, there are a lot of people who have power who think they're using it for good, and there's a lot of bad outcomes from their good acts. Have you noticed that? And we live in a world, and this is really important here. Understand this. You're going to understand a lot about the world if you can understand this philosophy. There's a philosophy in our world right now. It's called postmodernism. And the essence of postmodernism is this, uh, this concept. Power defines truth. So we as Christians believe there's an objective truth, and God in the form of Jesus was the ultimate truth. Now, that ultimate truth is so big, you're constantly learning what that means throughout your life, so it keeps us humble recognizing we never have ultimate truth. God is always revealing truth to us. And there's, he is ultimately true. But you've probably had some, some beliefs you held on to as true a long time ago that now you look at them and you're like, wow, I don't even believe that anymore. This is what I've found is true about God. And, and so truth is this huge concept. It's constantly changing uh, our real, our, it's not, truth isn't changing, but our understanding of the truth is constantly changing. Truth is truth. But we live in a world that says, well, truth is all subjective. Your truth, your reality, live your reality, man. But, but that doesn't work. Because eventually your reality bumps up against my reality. And do you know whose reality wins? He who has power. And throughout human history, the rule was might makes right. We, that's so foreign to us because we have a Christian framework. You say, well, I don't know about this Christian framework. We do have a Christian framework in the West. The West was built on a Christian framework. And the reason we even believe in compassion as any kind of a good thing is because of the influence of Jesus' teaching in Western Christianity. And we didn't get it right all the time, right? Slavery, or what about slavery? Yeah, we didn't get that one right. That was wrong. But the idea of even having compassion comes from Jesus because throughout history, if you had power, you used it for your own good. Might makes right. You probably heard the golden rule. He who makes the gold, makes, has the gold, makes the rules. That was the old golden rule. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus came along. He said, listen, you've heard it said, man, if you've got power, use it. I'm saying if you've got power, you need to submit that power. 
And people were like, wait, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, there was a thing called divine right, where it's like, if you were a king, it was because God had chosen you to be a king. And all those little peasants below you, it was because they, God hadn't chosen them. So you had every right in the world to do whatever you wanted with the little peasants. That was the mindset through most of history. And then Jesus came along and changed everything. And slowly that truth has been expanding throughout the world. But we, what's weird is we're, we're actually going backwards. We're going backwards in our society because we stopped deciding, we stopped believing that there's an ultimate truth. And we said, well, each person can define their, old, their own ultimate truth. And in postmodernism, they say that if you want, truth is defined by who has the power. So there's a guy named Michel Foucault. I'm going to read this quote from him, and I'm going to explain it, so don't zone out on me, okay? He's the guy that was kind of the, for, the forerunner of this whole thing. He's a French guy, and you see his philosophy everywhere in academia, in our country. It's, it's spread everywhere. He says this, truth is a thing of this world. We believe truth is a thing that came down from heaven to this world. He said, truth is just made up here on earth. It is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint. Whoever has the power and can tell you how things are going to be, they decide what truth is. These general politics and regimes of truth are the result of scientific discourse and institutions and are reinforced and redefined constantly through the education system. You wonder why our education system's gotten a little wacky? Because people have figured out if you can educate the kids early on into your way of thinking what truth is, you've got the power. They'll do what you want. Right. Right. The media and the flux of political and economic ideologies. He wrote this back in the 60s, I think it was. Oh, yeah, this is, the, well, actually, this was in the 90s. Never mind. In this sense, a battle for truth is not for some absolute truth, which we don't believe that as Christians. We believe there is an absolute truth. He says that can be discovered and accepted, but is a battle about the rules according to which the true and false are separated and specific effects of the power attached to the truth. Like, what in the world does that say? Here's what he's saying. He's saying if you can get a hold of the power, you can tell people what truth is. And he says, and, and here's the really dangerous thing about what he says. He says your version of truth is only dictated by who's been in power throughout your life. And this is where things like the critical race theory that you hear that says, basically they say, you're a racist even if you don't realize you're racist because you've been in a, a system of racism and you can't get out of it. So they'll use guilt to tell you, you're a racist. You're like, I don't think I'm a racist. Well, that's just because you don't know. <laughs> but I, the person with power, because I have a degree and I'm educated, I know for a fact you're racist. Because my truth is truth because I'm the educator and I have the power. And it's a very slippery slope, y'all. It's a very slippery slope because then you can turn your own personal racism, which I believe we all have a tendency to a little bit of it, so there's some truth in that. You can turn your own personal racism into saying, well, everybody that's that skin color is clearly racist. Well, that's kind of a racist thing to say. But it's because you hold the power. And this is the uncomfortable thing we're in because this is hard to argue with. You go, well, I, and there is some truth to it. Like if you have the power, you can define the rules. But we believe as Christians, there's an ultimate truth that's higher to th than that. And we are accountable to that truth, not to any truth you create. So what you see is a systematic, systematically people trying to undermine the idea that there's a, 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 an objective truth that doesn't change. And saying, well, your truth, you just believe that because of the power structures that have been established. Which is funny because they're basically saying, so, well, we'll just make the power structures about who has the power and we'll be the ones in power. And here's the really scary thing is. There's a lot of people who really think they're doing good, like we talked about last week. They really think they're doing good, but they don't have enough knowledge of the whole picture going on that they actually end up doing destruction in the end in the name of doing good things. And that's how you can look at some people and like, what kind of insanity? How can anybody think something that insane? They have really convinced themselves in their mind that this is a good thing. And it's because it's a battle for power. And they figure, if we can get the power, we can define the truth. And this is where Christianity butts up against this mindset, because Jesus said the total opposite. If postmodernism says power defines truth, Jesus says, nope, truth defines power. Amen. When you walk in the truth, you have power, regardless of whether anyone believes the truth that you're saying. If you're walking in the truth, there's a power you're walking with. So he says this, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me... You would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus says, look, 
in this world of might makes right, which is essentially what we're sliding back towards, that is the move of postmodernism is if we can just get control of education, if we can get control of government, that's why the stuff you see with like people fighting for these government positions is so important because in their mind, power makes you right. Now, they don't think it in that way, but that's the way, well, maybe they do think that way. I don't know what's going on in their heads, but I do know this mindset pervades everything. And that's where you see some of these critical theories you hear and all these ideas, and you say, how can anyone think that's a good thing? And they're so blinded by it. But what happens is ideology blinds you. Ideology says we have to fit everything into this lens, and if it doesn't fit, you're the problem. You're like, well, maybe the problem is that you've got a little blinder on you. And you, there's this, this ancient Greek myth of a guy named Procrustes. And he was a super hospitable guy who had this bed in his house. And when he had guests, uh, he wanted them to fit the bed perfectly. So if they came along and they were too big and they were guests, he was trying to be very kind to them. He, he would cut their legs off so they'd fit perfectly in the bed. <laughs> and if they were too short, he'd stretch them out so they fit perfectly in the bed. And he was such a magnanimous, upright guy. And that's what happens a lot of times with power is we say, this is the way the world works. You know, we, we, we ignore everything else. And sometimes that ideology comes from our own pain. All women are horrible. All men are horrible. All people of this skin color are horrible. And so you see the whole world through that. And if you see something that doesn't fit, you either ignore it or you try and make it cram into your little small perspective of the world. And you try and force people to cram into the perspective. But it's not that simple. And that's what we live in, in our world today. It's a bunch of people saying, no, I, this is my little ideology, and this is why it's so important. Christianity is not an ideology, y'all. Yeah. It's not an ideology. Christianity isn't so much about what you believe, like believing the right things. It's about having faith that there is a God who is out there who is revealing truth to you little by little, so you stay humble, recognizing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, that's right. But we never have all the truth, so you stay humble and say, there might be something I'm missing here. And a lot of these philosophies out there, even postmodernism, has some truth in it. It's just enough truth to where people go, yeah, I can latch on to that. But partial truth can lead you on a horrible path. And that's why you have to stay humble and say, maybe there's something wrong about this. And so Jesus showed up. And he's, he knew the ideologies of the world, might makes right, and he showed us in a completely different way. In fact, the Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus. So Jesus showed this example. The all-powerful, mighty God showed this example, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. All the power of God was living within him, but he didn't consider it something to be used to his advantage. It says, but instead he emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, which is what we celebrate in Christmas, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Father. That's real power. But the path to real power didn't come through power and force. It came through humility. If you notice, Jesus always used minimum necessary force. We live in a world right now that's like, drop the truth bomb and walk away. Wrong. That's not the key. To winning people's hearts. The key is minimum necessary force because you may blow up your opponent, your political enemy, the person you're in the battle with at home. You may blow your husband out of the water with truth, but you know, people that have been defeated in battle don't usually like hanging out with the people that defeated them. So you don't win. So the key is minimum necessary force. It's, it's, it's realizing, man, I may have all this power and knowledge, but I'm going to take everything that God has given me and I'm going to use minimum necessary force in this situation. You may need to speak truth into a situation, but you don't just drop a truth bomb and walk away. You remember that the most important thing is the relationship. That's why Apostle Paul said, always speak the truth in love. 
And we've gotten so polarized in our world because it's all about who's got the most power. And sometimes knowledge is power for us. Sometimes money is power. And so what we end up doing is we just go blasting the enemy who we perceive as the enemy, who really isn't the enemy. And then we go, yeah, I won, but you didn't win anything. What you did is you created even more of an enemy. Jesus came along and he said, no, look, if you really want victory and power in this world, he says this, this is what he said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for the meek will inherit the earth. Now, meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Jordan Peterson says it this way. He says, meekness is having a sword and knowing how to cut somebody's head off, but keeping it sheathed until the appropriate time. Doesn't mean you're a pushover. Doesn't mean you're a pansy. Doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're walking around with so much confidence that you don't have to use your power. Kind of like my friend who talked those cops down. He just walked up, said a few words, and it was all taken care of. Now, he was obviously involved in some bad stuff, right? But that's power. That's real power. When you, you can speak softly, but people know you're carrying a big stick, but you don't have to use that big stick because they know ultimately you love them. And meekness is, is, is using your strength. And I always, I always, like, what, I always wondered, like, what does inherit the earth mean? And I, it, here's what it made me think of. I was horrible at math in school. Horrible at math. But I had this one teacher one year named Miss Wrench. And she would stay with me after class and work with me until I understood. And for the first time in 10th grade, I understood math. First time in my life. She put in extra hours to make sure I understood. All the other math teachers were like, read the book and you'll learn it. I'm like, I've been reading the book and I don't get it. She would actually sit with me afterwards. And she would use her spare time to help me learn math. And you know what? I carry her with me in my heart here even 30 years later now. That's what it means to inherit the earth. When you've got strength and you know how to use it, but you use that strength instead to invest in others, to, to strengthen others and raise them up, man, those, you carry the, those people carry you with, with them for the rest of their life. And that's how you inherit the earth. They take a piece. The, a piece of you goes with them, that piece you've invested in them. So there's nothing wrong with being strong. We live in a world a lot of times where we're, we're telling men, you shouldn't be strong. It's toxic. No, no, men are made to be strong. Men, rise up and be as strong as you can so that you can use that strength to help and defend the weak. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be strong if it's got the right purpose. Jesus, who was God in the flesh, he used it. He humbled himself. He, he became meek. And he used it to strengthen others. So here's my key point. Humility, realizing there's a lot you don't know. And you don't have to know everything. It's okay. That's humility. Meekness, taking your strength, using minimum necessary force in every situation to make sure the relationship is, re is, is retained and kept and, and, and the other person is honored. Surrender. We talked two weeks ago about what do you need to let go of this year that you've been holding on to saying, this is the way it has to be. And God's like, no, that's not the way I want it to go. And you're fighting. You're literally fighting against God, trying to get it to be a certain way with your son or your daughter or your business or your spouse. Maybe you just need to let it go. Surrender. That's what Jesus did. He gave himself up to death on a cross. He didn't have to do that. And sacrifice are the path to true power in God's kingdom. And this is so contrary to everything we believe in this world. Everywhere in this world, we see, use your power. If you've got power, abuse it and use it. And we even think we're doing good when we're using our power. But oftentimes, we don't even see the other side of the results of using our power. And all these unintended consequences come because we think we're the virtuous people, but humility recognizing, man, I'm going to use power as, as judiciously, as carefully, as wisely as possible because I may be doing something that causes unintended harm because I don't have all knowledge and truth. There may be something on the other side of this I don't understand. And if I force somebody into doing this, the damage it may cause on the other side. And you say, well, I don't really like that position. Neither do I. I don't like being in a position of humility, weakness, surrender, meekness. Like, I'd rather just take my power, any ounce of power I've got, and use it for my advantage. I mean, if I'm honest. But Jesus set the example for us. The mighty God came down in the flesh. He humbled himself to be born as a baby. Babies are totally in need those first few years of their life. Man, all those times he could have called angels down to wipe out those people that were 
you know, think about that. If, what, what would the story have been like if he's walk, hanging with the cross here and finally he's like, I'm done with this. Snaps his fingers, the angels come down to slay everybody with a sword. We would have been in trouble because nobody could have, would have died for our sins. He was the only one that could do it. But he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take the beating. I'm going to take the heat. I'm going to live on this life because that is what true power looks like. Humility, meekness, surrender, and sacrifice. So let me ask you this question. What was that thing you said at the start that you would do with real power? Change, change your son or daughter? Change your spouse? Who's that person you would thought, I'm, I'm gonna take, I would take them out if I had real power? You didn't say it out louder, but you know you were thinking it. Oh, if I could just get rid of that guy, my life would be so much easier. What if you applied all of this to that situation? Humility. Maybe there's something about that person I don't understand. Meekness. You could use your strength to get your way, but instead saying, you know what, I'm going to use my strength instead to help them get their way. Surrender. Man, I really wanted it this way, but I'm going to stop fighting, and I'm just going to say, all right, God, not my will, but your will be done. And sacrifice. Giving of your time, giving of your resources. What if you did the complete opposite of everything that you would in your nature want to do with that power and you used this path? What could it do for the world? We talked last week about how you can't change the world, but you can change you. And as you change you, the world changes. And Jesus came and when he came, this was the example he showed us. He said, look, one person can change the world when you walk in these four things. So my encouragement for you guys this morning is, man, when you look around and you see people trying to get power, wielding, fighting for power, take the complete opposite path. You go, well, I might get run over abused. You might. Jesus did. But remember, that wasn't the end of the story. It says, and then God highly exalted him. And Jesus gets a place we don't get. He's going to be forever the king. But I do believe that when we walk in that surrender, he exalts us. It says those who humble themselves before the Lord at the right time, he will lift them up. The path is humility. He goes, that's so counterintuitive. It is counterintuitive, but it's the way the world will change. And that's what Jesus showed. He said, I'm going to change the world, and I'm going to show you a completely different way to do this. So my encouragement for you as you see the power being wielded around you, everyone trying to get power, everybody fighting for power, even little scraps of power, don't be that person. Say, God, I'm going to, man, I want to get strong and powerful, but I want to make sure it's not for me. I want to make sure that I use it for those around me to strengthen and lift them up. Because that's what Jesus did for you. And he's calling you to do the same for others. You receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you <clears throat> so much that you had all power. You're the mighty God. But you did not use it for yourself. You humbled yourself even to death on the cross. And now you're exalted above all other names. And we just pray, Lord, that that example would be the example that we constantly look to. When we see people trying to get power and we have this tendency to want to get power and control and, and manipulate and dominate and drop the truth bomb and get our way and show everybody how much we know, I pray, Lord, we would take the other path and say, you know what? What does meekness require of me in this situation? What does sacrifice require? What does love require in this situation? I thank you. You are the example. And I thank you that you're going to empower us to walk that just completely the opposite way of what most of the world walks. If you're here this morning, you have not given your life to Jesus. You have not surrendered. That's the first step in this surrender journey. Surrender your life to Jesus. And he will take you out of the kingdom of darkness, transfer you into the kingdom of light, set you up with an eternal address in eternity. And we're going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer, meaning in your heart, Jesus is going to come. He's going to forgive you of all your sins and get you set up in eternity walking with him. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn from my way. I turn to your way. Help me walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources in the back to help you on your new journey. I pray you guys have a blessed week. We will see you back here next week where we're going to be talking about the everlasting Father. Y'all be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.